was a couple of years ago. I made a film, Occupy and Mast, about, the, uh, about that war, starring uh, David Horowitz and Andrew Breitbart. It was actually the film we were making when Andrew passed away, and David was uh, kind enough to uh, take a bigger role in that. But uh, that, that film, I think, showed the, the precursor of a lot of what uh, laid the groundworks for the, uh, for the Trump victory. When I stepped into the campaign in mid-August of 2016, I think it was August 14th, uh, these numbers are rough, but it, roughly the um, candidate was down anywhere from 12 to 16 points, basically double digits down in every battleground state, every state that had to be won. Uh, not a lot of money, and as you've seen from revelations in this uh, investigation with uh, Manafort, uh, not a lot of organization. Um, the, the, the campaign from the time that Corey Ludendowski had left uh, until the time I stepped in in August had really deteriorated into um, a pretty disorganized mess that uh, left um, the best candidate I think we'd had since Reagan in real extremis. <laughs> and, and that's what I knew we had. I knew we had a great candidate. I knew we had um, uh, an individual who I believe was the finest orator in American politics since William Jennings Bryan. And, and uh, more importantly, more importantly, and I, I told uh, the president uh, or the candidate this, when, you know, when I took the job on the 13th and 14th, you know, don't pay attention to any of these numbers. Don't worry about your, you know, how many points down we are. Don't worry if we're in the battleground states. It's not relevant. Because uh, what is relevant is the themes that you're going to run on and how we're going to bring this home. We only got 85 days, but we're going to compare and contrast Hillary Clinton as tribune of a corrupt and incompetent elite. And we're going to, ha we're going to focus on a handful of themes that shows you as an agent of change. And all we have to do is give permission, people permission to vote for you as that agent of change and we're going to win this. And I told him that day on the evening of the 13th and then the day of the 14th, because he's a percentage player and he was asking what percentage is, I said, you have a 100% chance, metaphysical certitude of winning. Not, not a question, 100%. Uh, and we'll get into it later about Billy Bush weekend, et cetera. But you have 100% chance. The reason is, is what David said. You know, this is a war. This is a war for our country. You know, this country, this is going to take, we've been in this now, this war for a while. It's going to take another 15, 20, 25 years. And we're going to be one thing or the other on the other side of this. We're either going to be the country that was bequeathed us by the 14 or 15 generations that came before us, or there's going to be something radically different. And David Horowitz has been the leader of telling you what that radical difference is going to be and what this country is going to be if we don't, uh, if we don't fight and fight every day to take it back. The reason that we could st I could step in, in you know, with a team of you know, pulling Dave Bossie and Reince Priebus and Katie Walsh and, and others in, uh, and, and help uh, the president, because he's really the one that, was, uh, that won it, uh, that basically gave him the platform so that he could drive his message home, is for years I had been uh, spending time and listening to a guy that I came to greatly respect, that guy's Pat Cadell. And Pat had been doing research. There's uh, another, the unsung heroes, a gentleman who came to Restoration Weekend every year. It was a Palm Beach resident named Lee Hanley. And yeah, Lee Hanley's a, Lee Hanley is like when you read the history of the American Revolution, the Civil War, all these great events, you find out that these individuals in back that never won any credit, but if it was not for them, uh, the, the victory would not be achieved. Lee Hanley for years was a big believer, although a, a guy of, of tremendous wealth uh, and lived in Palm Beach and throughout the rest of the world, had an incredible appreciation for the grassroots. He had a real love of the hobbits, of the deplorables. And, uh, and, and he, put, he put his money where his mouth was. He's a big supporter of Tea Party movement and Tea Party causes. But I think what he'll be known for is that he was the guy that really became the sponsor for the analytical work and the intellectual work that Pat Cadell did over a number of years. And this work really, epitom two things epitomize the Trump revolution, the Trump revolt. It's uh, J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly Elegies. If you haven't read it, it's quite powerful, the sociological content of the Trump revolt. But as important 
uh, was Pat Cadell's analytical work on where the country was, and that's what I told the president, or they told the candidate that night. I said, "Hey, two thirds is a two thirds, one third. Two thirds think the country's in the, going in the wrong direction. Uh, Seventy-five percent think America's in decline. Uh, not, you know, virtually none of the electorate believe that Obama brought the change, the, the fundamental change that they wanted. And people are looking for an agent of change. Now, the mainstream media doesn't cover that. You would know that by the campaign in mid-August of 2016. That was never talked about, but." That tone below the surface is the, is the foundational element, the keystone that really drove the, uh, the Trump campaign. So Pat, I'd like to, like to, if you could just tell us what it was, and this is very important. We're gonna talk about how we won and what the underlying analytics of that was, and then to get to David's point. Um, it makes total sense when you see that the left, there was no honeymoon, right? Because they will never concede, ever, that the basic working class Americans think America's in decline. They will never, because it's been their watch. And the elites in this country will never, never, will never admit to that. And that's why from day one, the second part of this talk will be about the nullification project. Because since 2.30 a.m. on November 9th is when AP called the election, the progressive left, the opposition party media, and the Republican establishment have been on a nullification project. Pat, you want to talk about the, the math? To echo what Steve said about Lee Hanley, he, um, back in 2011, 2012 actually, 2012, 2013, uh, after the Romney disaster uh, election, or as I call it, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the confluence of the uh, Republican uh, consultant lobbyist core of, uh, of um, gangsters. Uh, the RICO campaign, as I call it, the RICO campaign. <laughs> anyway, the, um, uh, I said, I think something's happening in the country. Lee said, you know, I think something may be too. I want you to go out and just find out. He wasn't for anybody or any cause. It was basically to discover what was there. And it was the most startling research that's ever been done. It has been public for some time. Uh, the press has never paid attention. The political class paid, won't pay attention. Um, but what we found from the beginning was, and I had been as a student in politics when I was in, started in high school and college on alienation, the level of discontent in this country was beyond anything measurable, and I believe any time that we have ever seen in our country. And um, <clears throat> uh, Steve mentioned a couple of the attitudes about things going in the wrong direction, the 70, 75% of people who absolutely believed the country was in decline. A, a narrative so different from what Washington was telling us or the mainstream media, if you looked at their, the way they uh, covered the conventions even. Oh my God, it's so dark. It's like the inaugural speech, it's so dark, it's terrible. No, it happens to be the truth, but they're not allowed to speak that. So, um, and then, Another attitude which is really important was the fact that in a country where we believe that if you work hard and play by the rules, you can get ahead. As Bill Clinton used to tell us, uh, all of uh, about 15% of the people believe that's what works. And the 85% who believe that the rich and powerful have rigged the rules and, and, and have the advantage, which is also a truth. And uh, when I was at Harvard, uh, I was at my class reunion, which I've never been to before, uh, for a reason I had to do a survey. And my class, which I would describe, I described to them the uh, class of 72, which was the, uh, as I said, the epicenter of the uh, white um, uh, Ivy League privileged class. Uh, the, uh, they were, they actually were higher than the, the only thing they were higher than the American people on was 95% of them knew that's the way it worked because that's how they worked it. And, uh, but in any event, those things all led to also the fact of a couple of attitudes that have maintained themselves, which I realized the real question is, would anybody weaponize them and uh, they had to do with so let me just give you a couple because they're important uh, political leaders are more interested in protecting their power and privilege than what is doing right for the American people 81 percent of the Americans agree. by the way we have a divided country except when it comes to how Americans from left to right really think of how this country works and that is the difference it isn't partisan at this point it's overwhelming the power of ordinary people to control our country is getting 
weaker every day. Political leaders on both sides fight to protect for their own power and privilege at the expense of the nation's well-being. 79%. These are just from just a few months ago. Powerful interests from Wall Street banks to corporations, unions, political interest groups have used campaign and lobbying money to rig the system for themselves. They are looting the national tre treasury of billions of dollars at the expense of every man, woman, and child. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, 72 to 75 percent. People, uh, excuse me, I believe the government is working for the people's best interests. 28 percent say that's true, 67 don't. Politicians really care about me? When I first started polling and then it wrote this question, um, the, uh, the result was, it was about a 40-50 split. It's now 19% say yes, agree, and 76 disagree. And perhaps most interesting of all is the question we asked the, de the, the, the Declaration of Independence says that the government operates, um, receives their authority from the consent of the people. Does the federal government today have the consent of the people? And it's 68 to 75 percent we've ranged saying no. And I call that, when I first saw that result in 2013, a pre-revolutionary moment. And we were, the question was whether anybody would speak to any of this. And that is, um, and from the beginning, Donald Trump, a lot of his own instincts were, and that's not exactly the way I would have designed it, but he managed to make a campaign. And he stood up against 16 other people who were, in, in their own ways, essentially epitomizing the political class or the ideological class of their party when the issue was neither ideology or, um, uh, or uh, uh, the, the, right, uh, the, the um, uh, right of kings of our political class to rule. You know, I said in the, uh, the day before the election, I wrote a piece because I need to get it out because I've been uh, doing some work for Breitbart and I've been uh, doing some polling and we were asking some more in-depth questions and I could see what I had found in a big study we had done in September, which was that you had a quarter of the country who were not favorable to either Clinton or Trump. Most of those people were concerned about Trump's qualifications, whether he was, had the temperament to be president, things that would have normally disqualified. Hillary Clinton was viewed as a, let's put it this way, when 75% of the people, including almost a majority of your own people, believe that there are two sets of rules of law, one for everyone else and the one for the Clintons. And uh, the corruption, the crook and corruption, is a problem, and we'll talk about that today. But at the heart of much of this was a sense of the corruption and loss of our country. Those people started breaking for Donald Trump. Well, I was waiting for that to happen. I'd seen some evidence in a different situation in 1980 with Reagan and Carter. But what was important is when I saw the exit polls, everyone saw the exit polls at, uh, when we got them at 5, 5.30 at the networks, and Everyone's running, oh, Hillary's got it, Hillary's got it. Well, first of all, nobody remembers that those polls are always wrong because of the bias in them. But more importantly, nobody bothered to look inside. They did have a question, because I had urged our people to have it on there, to, to get a breakdown. The people who had said that they were unfavorable to both were now breaking to Trump by 18 points. And I called Steve and said, these exit polls are all wrong. This is the key break. And it is breaking for Trump. I do believe, and I don't want to get into it, but this mistake of early voting, which does not, we were supposed to have an election, not, not a rolling election. A lot of people, it is the problem with all reform that, uh, that, uh, that uh, um, you know, that the unintended consequences. People vote who will change their mind. So there you had it, Trump won, and everyone else in the media was stunned because they would not look at the, the country it, that, they, that they actually deplore. What, what do you think was the specific messaging that, uh, that drove those low propensity voters uh, to, to actually, at the end of the day, pull the trigger for Trump? Yeah, well, my, as I said, before, uh, my question all along had been whether those voters would respond. Uh, alienation can often make people uh, uh, depressed, I mean, and not participate. 
Um, what did it, I think, is if you look at the last eight to ten days of Trump's message, where he said, this isn't about me and Hillary, this is about you and them. Essentially a campaign that said, your country is going to hell, Can you, you have to do something. And, he, and whether it was on immigration, which was a big issue, trade, where the country had taken a huge leap, or basically the idea, which I think was the most powerful of all, of drain the swamp and the corruption. And enough people felt that they, with good reason, they wanted change, and they took the biggest gamble in history. That by every other measure we have had, this never should have happened. But the reason it did is because the country has never been where we are, except twice before, I believe, in the 1820s and the Civil War, well, three times, and the Great Depression. And uh, we are, what we have is a new paradigm in politics. This isn't the traditional Democrat, Republican, liberal and conservative. This is inside, outside, us, them, and the question of whose country it is. And I have said, said to Steve the other day, and I'll end on this note, at the heart of it is a perception, I think, I, I think the summary you could make, the subtext, is that they know that their leaders are trying to manage the decline of America. This is um, the key point. They think yeah. that their job is to make the reason. Stop. Okay, the the the, the, the we're going to frickin' frack this a little bit. Um, this is the key point. The American people have a great common sense. Yes. Right. Great That's common sense. That's the ideology of America. When, when, when Pat Cadell starts to stand, we're in trouble. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Now he's I'm really about to go sense. Old Testament prophet. I'm, on I'm going to my. I'm going if to you my remember, If you remember CPAC a couple of years ago, he was in a ballroom this size, and people were tweeting, you got to get up there. Cadell was so over the top. He was Cadell unchained. That I thought they were going to throw a net over him and, you know, escorted him out. And they've never had me back after Never that. had him back. <laughs> no. The, 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 the issue of the polling and the analytical work, which was so thorough, this is not some... Uh, slapdash poll uh, like is, is done the all the time. Do. This was really a d deep analytical work. The question that the American people answered, 75% of your countrymen think America's in decline. And what they understand is the country is in decline, right? Particularly vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And that's what the, the elites, that was the whole contrast in the campaign. Hillary Clinton and the Republican elites are very comfortable managing that economy. Yes, they believe their destiny, I think, is to make sure it is soft. That we like the Britons, that we will, British will be soft. I have news for them. In this election in 2016, and the ones that are coming are really about a fact that this country will not go gently into that good night of decline. They will rage, rage against the dying of the light. Now here's the great news that understands this, is the American working man and woman. I mean, that's why Trump's brilliance of make America great again the resonated The single so greatest slogan in my lifetime in American politics, in terms of what summed it all up. And it came that out that was compared to and contrast, what was Hillary's happy together? What was it? Yeah. <laughs> was happy together? Is someone like happy no. together? <laughs> Happy together, whatever it was. Happy yes. together. Forward, whatever. Yeah, forward. For, whatever Happy it was. forward together. <laughs> Always forward. Oh, um, never back. The millions of dollars they spent to come up with the dumbest slogan I've ever heard of <laughs> is amazing. The, the, before we get through the victory and, and, and talk about what happened the next day, was that um, you got to remember, and this is very pertinent, I think, to the folks in, in the audience. Um, 85, I think I count, 85 percent of the votes in the Republican primary, if you totally t take away all the, the, the bi-state stuff, but you look at the total vote count, I think 85 percent went to Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and Dr. Ben Carson. Yes, well, I right? kept saying... Which you a... couldn't get three more anti-establishment guys, yeah, right? It shows the... you the party, this is what McConnell and the donors don't get. The votes are with the working men and women in this country, the Republican Party. Well, let, let me make a point on that. All during the primaries. I, I was on a show we had on Fox, which a lot of people watch, called Political Insiders with Doug Schoen and John Labudier. And uh, we, and I said all along, we kept noticing, the look at the vote of the anti-establishment candidates everywhere you go. And you're right. Yes. 
give Steve some time on the microphone, please? Oh. Oh, we, we, we are. Hang on. We're, we're freaking fracking it. We got it. <laughs> my agent right there. I'd like to introduce oh. my agent. Thanks, brother. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Is, is what you were saying? No, I'm done. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, no. no, no, I'm not. You know, I know what I'm not wanting. Yeah. No, the, uh, no yeah. it's just this is the fact that in both parties, look what you have with Bernie Sanders. You have, and we, well, hopefully we'll get a point to talk about that rigging of that system. But Bernie Sanders, who nobody ever cared about and whatever, he rolls up. He and Trump were, as I like to say, were supping out of the same trough, like on trade and corruption and whatever, Wall Street, the same thing on both from opposite ends. And that's what the unity of these numbers were about. Well, and the numbers show you, the, the, in the strategy we had, we had kind of two plans. But the first plan, we had to take, remember, this is 85 days ago, right, where you're, you're, you're basically going to get blown out. And if you read their books, they thought they were going to win by 25 or 30 points, take the House, the Senate, the courts. It was basically over. Break the back of the Republican Party. But the key, we had to win Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Iowa just to get to the table. That just positioned us, and by the way, I don't think in living memory any, any Republicans done that. You had to get there just to get the, the final, that was the, the bridge that got you to, the, to be able to, to, we had a plan A and a plan B, but plan B, which was taking, shattering the blue wall in the upper Midwest, we did some very specific demographic analysis uh, around how the messaging that Pat had overall talked about, how it was playing. We see in places like Youngstown, Ohio, and Dubuque, Iowa, and other places that the message was resonating um, with um, with not just Republicans, but with blue-collar Democrats or independents that had not voted for a Republican in living memory. And that's why we could see Western Pennsylvania, we could see Wisconsin, we could see Michigan. I mean, the only, uh, and by the way, Minnesota, which we lost by one point, um, we could see that something was changing, and that was the message, this underlying uh, discontent in the country and wanting fundamental change in Trump's ability to be the instrument or the message that, that was starting to, to, uh, to galvanize people. It was interesting. The only question I had internally is that the math looked so, you know, so dramatic. And, you know, we kind of knew we were, you know, working on this and it was coming together because we see the crowds are getting bigger at the rallies, they're getting more vocal. The Facebook and all the social media stuff was working. Is that her campaign specifically didn't come to these places. They didn't come to Wisconsin to the very, uh, they never came to Wisconsin. I don't think they, they came to Michigan like the, the very 11th hour. And so there was a, um, we really knew that uh, there was something underlying the Trump message and that's this discontent in the country that's still there today. In fact, I would actually respect submit, it's probably greater today than it was even a year ago, and that's about the progress or maybe the lack of progress that's been made. I want to talk about the morning after, and Pat, you've got some, uh, a thing from the with Clinton campaign of one of her books. Yeah. The nullification, you know, David talked about a honeymoon. There was no intention of a honeymoon, and here's why. They do not think that this was a legitimate election and that we won legitimately. They will, they will never be able to admit that the working men and women in this country basically revolted, essentially from both political parties, and elected a total and complete outsider. Someone who's not a professional politician, someone who can connect, does not use the vernacular of the political class, but somebody that can connect uh, viscerally with the working men and women in this country and had an agenda of being a complete disruptor uh, among the institutions that really uh, govern the imperial city. If you think about it, in, and I'll talk a little bit more about it tonight, the geopolitical situation we're in that's driving the economics of this country, but the ascended economy of Silicon Valley in Wall Street, in Hollywood, in the imperial city of Washington, D.C., is completely detached from the reality of everyday life in, uh, in the rest of America. And they do not believe, uh, they will never ratify the election of 2016, to, because to ratify it is actually calling the question their own tenuous grip on power. Uh, we saw that immediately. I mean, and, and Pat's got a very interesting uh, quote he's pulled out from, the, uh, from one of the Clinton books. The book Shattered, which was the, the two embedded reporters who had in the Clinton campaign who were to chronicle the great, uh, uh, the great uh, victory and uh, ascendancy of Hillary Clinton. And this is what it says. By the way, 
people might reference, but I want to read you what they say. This is how it started. The strategy had been set well within 24 hours of the concession speak. Mook and Podesta, the campaign manager and chairman, assembled their, their, their communications team at the Brooklyn headquarters to engineer a ga a ga the case that the election wasn't entirely on the up and up. For a couple of hours with Shake, with shake Shack containers littering the room, they went over the script, they would pitch to the press and the public. Already Russian hacking was at the centerpiece of that of their arguments. And that's yeah, this, how it began. Yeah, this this nullification project, which was both from the uh, from the left and also from I think the Republican establishment, started immediately on the morning of the uh, of the ninth uh, and the tenth, at which they had to uh, you know come up with an excuse for why they they lost. It wasn't the fact they had 2.2 billion dollars. Uh, it wasn't the fact that they spent 750 million dollars, I think, to the number I've heard, uh, on negative ads against Donald Trump. It's not the fact that uh, they had, I believe. The worst candidate for President of the United States in memory. Unbelievable. The, the, you know, they keep saying how brilliant she is, how genius she is, how smart she is. I think she's dumb as a stick. <laughs> I, I, see, I'm a big proponent. I'm a big proponent. She's doing her book tour. It's another 900-page book that she's written. In fact, I would just like to have the corrupt media and publishing industry just write her a $10 million check and don't force another 900-page book on us. <laughs> uh, but no, no, I do think in, in her current tour, or at least until the Donna Brazil uh, situation came up that Pat will talk about in a minute, that you know she's got every intention of testing the water to run again in 2020. And my response is, bring it, baby. <laughs> bring it. As Would you not love to see a rematch of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? Come on. As Saturday Night Live predicted last week with her in the final episode for the Democrats, one more time for me. Maybe one more one after time. that. Right, time, one more time. After that. But, let's but let's talk about this nullification. The Russian, well, look, the Russian yeah. uh, you know, uh, whatever this thing is, the uh, collusion project, is, uh, look, as the campaign CEO, in the uh, last 85 days as we drove to victory, I can tell you categorically that we had a very difficult time colluding between the Trump ground game in Pennsylvania and the RNC. So, you know, yeah. collude that. Yeah, it's well, it's 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 it, it's it's totally it's it's a complete phony hide the football misdirection play, but it shows you their desperation. Let me let me make just one two quick points on this. First of all, the one I wanted to make: if Barack Obama knew about this in August, so did the quote intelligence team, the, those hacks that Trump described, in which they are, um, and uh, and you know. If it were such a threat to America, why was the President of the United States keeping his mouth shut until the day after the election? And how come nobody bothered to tell America was under attack? Because it didn't matter. The, there's a point, like on the Facebook stuff, uh, that uh, Mark Penn, uh, who had run Hillary's great campaign in 2008, did say $100,000 on Facebook ads, 44, 56,000 of it after the election, half of it in states that were California, New York, and Texas. Let me tell you, so the Stanford study, Stanford University Economics Department did a major study on this. And they found when anyone who actually asked will tell you, nobody believes what they see on Facebook. Um, it's the last least credible source. And yet, you know why they have to go on to that? Because underlying it is the subtext, which you people, the American people, are too damn stupid. That you could, all the billions spent, the debates, people know what they're getting. They're weighing the heavily. No, no, no. You're so stupid, you can be misled because you didn't listen to us. And that is their message. That, that is why it's so important, I think, for the, the defense of the president, is that we're seeing something unprecedented here in American history. And I think it's very important we fight it and we, and we drive it into the ground. Uh, as much for 
the Democrats as, as for Republicans in the fact that if we allow this nullification project to continue to go forward, if we allow this nullification project to, uh, to, to really get traction and to try to bring charges or whatever against the president, every election here on in, trust me, is going to be contested. We'll be like a banana republic. You won't have elections that matter. Now let's talk about the nullification project of where they're trying to drive the president into the ground. They're currently, I think, five or six major investigations going on with the president right now. You've got, and this is what upsets me so much when I left the, uh, when I left the White House. Uh, my, my specific project was against Republican leadership because you have three, count them, three committees on Capitol Hill. Uh, with full subpoena power and the unlimited budgets, uh, you have the uh, and you had Devin Nunez today, one of the great uh, young men on uh, on Capitol Hill. Yeah, he he's a hero, and he should be running the investigation on the House Intelligence. Why is he not? Because Paul Ryan doesn't have a spine, right? The media spooked Paul Ryan. By the way, Paul Ryan's a nice guy. He's a, he's a good guy, but he just he doesn't have backbone in this regard. The, the Republican, the media can can spook these guys and they'll run. Nunez has turned it over essentially to Schiff. So you have a Democrat running the uh, the House Intel Committee. You have Mark Warner, who's going to run for the presidency in 2020 against President Trump. You have him running the uh, the uh, intelligence, the Senate intelligence, because Burr's just taking a pass on this. So you have two Democrats running this and leaking everything to the media. The thing's gone way outside Russian. Collusion. They've got Michael Cohen and his lawyer and other guys up there talking about real estate deals, taxes, whatever. You've got the Judiciary Committee is hauling in Don Jr. and these other guys. Can you imagine, can you imagine if Hillary Clinton had won? Would Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi have three committees on the Hill investigating Hillary Clinton and her campaign and her finances and let two Republicans run it? No. Because they are they're professionals. They, they run the Democratic Party like it's supposed to be run, right? And they never give up. And they understand this is a war. And they understand the way they're going to win is be unified. In addition to that, you've got, you've got uh, you know, uh, Bob Mueller. And I was the, one of the biggest advocates in the, in the White House of you can't fire Comey, right, for a whole host of reasons. Because and at the end of the day, you're going to end up with something like a special counsel, like a, a Bob Mueller, see where they get you. And I've been adamant, you know, uh, Bob Mueller, in regards to his mandate, of looking at um, anything with Russian collusion. He should be able to do that. He should have a budget for that. But I report, I support Ron DeSantis. When he's outside the range there and... Absolutely. And you got to remember, on, on Manafort, Manafort was, I think all 12 indictments are about back taxes and quote, quote, money laundering and stuff he took from other people. Uh, you know, Rick Gates didn't even have a, he walked in with a public defendant. He didn't even know that he was under investigation. So this thing, I think, has gotten way off the rails in the fact that it's b much too broad and not within the mandate. And I think that, and look, Jeff Sessions is a, I consider him a dear friend, but I think De Sessions, Rosencrantz, and people on the Hill got to support the DeSantis Amendment, which says, hey, there's going to be a time period and a budget to look at collusion with Russia. Anything else is off limits. Yeah, well, I want to add just a quick comment to this, which is that I want to hear from my good friend, Mr. Abrams, when he speaks uh, that, about the Justice Department. It seems to me that department is still being run embedded deeply with the people who have been in the business of supporting whatever the political class and particularly the Democrats want done. And let me say something. When, when you get someone appointed like Bob Mueller, who is, quote, highly respected by everyone in Washington, grab your wallet. The last person that they told me about that was James Comey. You know, I mean, really, anybody who everyone says is this great, respectable guy, you got to watch out because he is there doing business that is not going to be very, very productive for the country. Now, the nullification project also is, is a joint venture. It's both the Democratic Party and the Republicans. You know, Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan have no, in fact, it's taken tremendous pressure on them even to say these things have got to be brought to an end. They've got to end around Christmas, and they've and they got to have joint reports. You can't let them have two reports. And that's not officially done yet, but these guys are just as culpable in this as the Democrats, you know, that are baying from the left. Look. Donald Trump's greatest opposition is not from the Democrats. It is from the never-Trump Republicans who fill now 
uh, several networks, um, cable news networks, with people whose, uh, whose virulence to Donald Trump makes the Democrats in those places look tame. And the Jennifer Rubens, the Washington Post, and it's 15 pieces a day attacking Trump, the New York Times, all of which, by the way, and that's another point that they're not, we're getting a little progress on the rest of the corruption. It seems to me that the notion that oh, we should move on, and by the way, then the other, this other stuff never happened, which I don't know if we'll get to, but it's just bullshit, but pardon my language, but it did. The corruption here is so deep. And the difference with the Democrats and Republicans, as David pointed out and Steve just said, as let me tell you something, Mr. Democrat. You know, there is no longer the Clintons, as I once wrote in 1998, have forced Democrats, their machine, starting with Bill Clinton, to squeeze themselves into that tiny little space that's known as Clinton morality. They've had to give up, we, my, my party has had to give up all of its principles in order to sustain corruption, which is why the left is in motion. And by the way, one point, when you have a large majority of both, saying that both the Democrats and the Republicans, that they're out of touch with the country. That coalition is in jeopardy, except if you don't, as long as you fight them. And the Republicans not only don't fight, they stab themselves in the back and their president. See, that's the, the point. Remember, the point of the nullification project is their ultimate goal is to remove President Trump from office, right? Or to force him to resign. That's their goal. But They've got, a sub, they've got a second goal, which they're just as comfortable with, and that is to so damage him in the eyes of the American people that he's very restricted on what he can do and what he can accomplish. And so that's why every day you see this drumbeat. And I will tell you, the, um, you know, outside of Breitbart and Gateway Pundit and a handful of others, the, uh, the sore losers in the media, the conservative media, starting with my beloved Wall Street Journal owned by Rupert Murdoch, um, is, is, uh, they're just never Trump organs every day. Right, it's the Never Trump guys have, have a, a complete ability to just launch on the president. So I think if you're a supporter of President Trump, uh, we've only really started th this fight because this is going to get really gnarly uh, over the next couple of uh, months. I think it's going to get by the, by the fr end of the first quarter of 2018, uh, I think it's going uh, to get quite, uh, quite volatile. And so the president is going to need all of his supporters uh, to, fall in, uh, to fall in and have his back on this thing. Let me say, I've been thinking about 2018 um, election, uh, and now I, I know how what this is going to be about, I believe it, should, and I believe the Democrats can't control their left. It's going to be from beginning to end if the president is smart, and sometimes I don't understand, frankly, the politics around the president, because in some ways I think he is being misled and taking down the primrose path by the very people he clobbered and wiped out who are taking, and I'm sorry, I can, I'm an independent I can, person, I can say this. I'm very, it makes me very sad because the swamp, the, I won't even get into the tax bill, which I think is an example of this. But let me tell you what, the campaign starts on the issue of if the Democrats win, they are going to impeach the president in the House, for sure. The question we're going to have is the one we kind of had in Wisconsin. Do we have what Steve said? Our democracy collapses now because it is now we can throw out who's in there that we don't like on either side. And that question is bigger than Trump, and it is about the democracy. And the real question is, who is sovereign in this country? And the American people intend to be the sovereign masters of their country, and that we, you've got to appeal to them on that basis in this kind of fight. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind, uh, on the uh, 14th, the, the first phone call I made was to Reince Priebus at the RNC um, to uh, work out a partnership which we could work together. You know, I'm a fire-breathing populist and a nationalist, and I am damn proud of it. Uh, but to, in, order, in, order, in order to win, we win as a coalition. You know, um, if you look, and this is one thing I can never forgive a Bush 41 for when he said the other day in this book, The Last Republicans, or should I, I think it would be titled, I, I hope, The Last Bush Republicans. Yeah. When, when old man Bush, you know, between grabbing women in the, in the Oval Office, <laughs> yeah, I went there. 
When he says that he voted for Hillary Clinton, and when Bush 43, when Bush 43, the most destructive president and the most destructive presidency in the history of our country, including James Buchanan, when he says he didn't vote, he voted some right in, or he didn't vote for, uh, he didn't vote for President Trump, that's all you know, it's all you gotta know about those guys. If they can't see the basic fundamental difference between what the uh, regime of the Clintons would be versus what President Trump offered, then I've got no time for them, right? They, they, they have... But to Pat's research, it, it shows in high relief exactly what we're fighting. Everything you see on cable TV, everything you see in the foreground is just pro wrestling, right? It's, to, it's really to divert the attention of what's really going on. At the end of the day, the Bushes, I mean, this is Bush that goes around with Bill Clinton. He says it's like the, you know, the son I never had, right? Old man Bush is going around saying Bill Clinton, because the permanent political class is inextricably linked with themselves. And you see it on this current tax bill, right? The, the, the donor, corporatist, um, lobbyist, consultant apparatus that uh, that runs Washington D.C. and I'm very proud of Peter Schweitzer, who's been the, you know the head of the a foundation, hero. a true patriot hero. Yeah, P Peter Schweitzer's effort in the three books, throw them all out, extortion, and then Clinton cash, w which we exposed how the apparatus works and why the seven of the nine richest counties in the country surround Washington D.C. Why the per capita income, the per capita income in those counties is higher than the per capita income in Silicon Valley for the first time in our history. And Silicon Valley is the greatest generator of wealth in human history. So you see that they have, it's a business model. And they're not prepared to give it up and they're not prepared to go, they're not prepared to go quietly. But on that campaign, the establishment, at least some of them, came together and worked with us. And that's how, we've, that's how we've got to win. We have to be unified. We're not going to get everything, right? We're, we're, I'm much more of a, uh, a protectionist when it comes to trade. I, I happen to think that free trade is a radical idea. I think it's a radical idea, particularly against a Confucian mercantilist uh, authoritative dictatorship like China. You cannot, be, you cannot allow your markets to be totally open. Not everybody agrees with that. A lot of guys at Heritage don't. A lot of guys at Cato don't. A lot of guys at uh, AEI don't. But we've got to work together to pull this off because if we lose, and every day is going to be a battle. If we lose, we're never going to get this country back. Now, you're seeing that, I think uh, David brought up a point on our show this morning. He just brought up here in his introduction. The question before us is very simple, as conservatives. Does the establishment that still controls the apparatus of the Republican Party, the question we have to call, and I, I'm dedicating my life now to call this, is it better for them to control that apparatus in a minority or is it better for us to take that apparatus and keep a majority? Because quite frankly, they would rather be in a minority as long as they control that apparatus because it's central to their business model. Right, exactly. They, don't, they never cared about losing. I learned that in 2012. The most important thing was to maintain their piece of the action. And this is, and, and let me just say something, because this is where Steve and I, this is a time for a real thoughtful, intellectual, political theory, debates about where, what to go. There are, the, my problem with the Republican Party is the voters want nothing to do with their leadership. They have proven that over and over. Look at the latest poll in Alabama where McConnell has a rating of 21% favorable and almost 60 negative among Republicans, you know? The people know this. They voted them out. They beat them every chance they could. And the question is whether that group, and I'm concerned about the independents who supported Trump, and many Democrats on the other side, on, on, uh, on the uh, uh, particularly labor, blue collar people. That is a governing and ruling majority if one can achieve it. And the, how this all works itself out is the real challenge. But I think you have to go to high ground. The issue is the country. It's not which party, it's going to be who owns the country, them or you. And the question is, is America going to go into the general night of decline, or are we going to turn things around for our children and grand? These are great moral questions. And that is the new battleground. 
that needs to be fought. And let me just say something. These two, God, these two parts. The media. You know, we used to have to go to David, what point David was made. You know, the press, which was, ad, you can argue, is adversarial. But what we have is not adversary. We have a partisan opposition press, which works hand in glove, which is the most corrupt media, and which, by the way, is a believer in the First Amendment, totally threatens the First Amendment. Because as I have tried to say to people, when they figure out, which they have, that there is, you know, that they can not only tell you who you must vote for, but they can tell you what truth you're allowed to know or not to know, as we have seen in all of this other stuff with Russia, all of the stuff with uh, um, uh, the Clinton Foundation, the, the, all these things, the real question becomes, why do we need a First Amendment if they're not going to do their job, which is to be the tribune of the people, and instead become the outriders of one political movement or See, another? See, I look at it differently than Pat. I like having the media as the opposition party because they're so dumb and lazy. <laughs> That's true. I detest them. I detest them. Dumb, lazy, worthless, a great opponent. Uh, one, one last thing. We've, we've got to wrap up here okay. is that... Uh, it's about the president. It's about Donald J. Trump. Look, I got the great opportunity. I'd known him for years, but I didn't know him that well until I got into the campaign. I saw it every day. You know, here's a guy. Everything you see in the mainstream media is, is basically nonsense. Here's a guy that was worth, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight billion dollars. I don't know the exact number, but a lot of money. Um, he was 70 years old. Um, he was, uh, has a lovely wife, a great family, great kids, grandchildren. The friends he's got from the sports and entertainment world and the business world are so close to him and such great people. Uh, he just had, he had a perfect lifestyle. I mean, here's a guy at 70 years old that's going around not just buying great hotels and refurbishing them and, 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 and making them part of his uh, Trump organization, but buying great golf courses and like turning, you know, making them better and getting them in the U.S. Open Rota or the Open Championship Rota. It's the kind of thing you would do that all of us would do when we're 70 years old. He ran for president of the United States. Not for, he's not a narcissist and not for ego or anything like that. You couldn't do it for that. I saw this guy every day on the politics of personal destruction where they came after him hammer and tong. And you guys only saw a tenth of it. If you saw the other 90%, you'd just be stunned. These people know no bounds. They have, they, I don't, you know, I, I don't really disagree with it because I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to take control of the most powerful nation on earth. They and they're prepared it. to do anything to do that. Donald Trump is an American hero because he had the courage to step up and run. And of all the, of all the, of all the great, in, in, in that primary, if you think about it, with, with, with Jeb Bush and, and Marco Rubio and, you know, Ted Cruz and, and, and Christie, go through all of them. 16, that was the Republican Party's, an entire generation of their best politicians that have been kind of bred for 10, 20, 30 years. And as good as those gentlemen are, and Carly Fiorina, there's not one, or even combined, could they have taken on the Clinton apparatus? The Clinton apparatus is a killing machine, okay? Yes. And it took somebody like Donald Trump, a blunt force instrument, to defeat it. And, and <laughs> go ahead. Uh, let me make a point, then you can finish. I just want to say one quick thing. Yeah. One quick thing, David Holland. The authenticity question, which is important, even during the election, Better than two-thirds of people believed that Trump was authentic and that Hillary wasn't, including almost half of Hillary's own voters. So that will tell you. And the last comment I have to make is what you're seeing with Mr. Franken, when you see what's coming, uh, when they announce the fifth, when they have to release the $15 million of your money that was paid out in 260 settlements secretly for sexual harassment, it's going to make the bank scandal of 1990 look like nothing. One, 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 one last thing, David. Pr look, I would love to wave a magic wand and tell you it's all going to be better, right? Yeah. Take your nappy off, powder your bottom, pat you on the head and tell you that, you know, November 8th was a... November 8th, we're going to celebrate it every year, November 8th and 9th, as MAGA Day. It's a high holy day for the, for the, for, for, for the populist, nationalist, conservative movement. But this is why things like Restoration Weekend are so important. Every day's a fight. And the guys on the other side of the football, and they showed this in Virginia, they're going to outwork you, they're going to out-hustle you. If we're not prepared to line up and fight every day, we're going to lose this country. 
Okay, we're going to lose it. If you're prepared, and I'll take the guys on our side of the football, I'll take the hobbits, I'll take the deplorables, I'll take the working men and women in this country. But as long as you're prepared to lead them and prepared to say, we're prepared to fight this every day, we're prepared to have Donald Trump's back every day, and we're not going to take defeat. And when something like happens to Judge Moore down there, on the first allegations, you run for the tall grass to hell with you. Yes. Thank you.